Okay, uh, let's get started. So it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Maria Gurich uh, here at CETA giving the uh, seminar talk. Maria is a, a director of the Dirac Institute uh, at the University of Washington and a professor of astronomy. And he is mainly interested in making the best possible use of uh, observational data uh, with some uh, sophisticated algorithms and software. And he will be talking about just this in the realm of uh, the solar system uh, in his talk today. So uh, welcome Mario and take it away. Thank you, Rainier. Um, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be back at the um, I see Scott here. Scott was my thesis advisor. So this feels like the general exam all over again. Um, except that Scott always had a poker face. I could never tell what he thinks. Now he has a mask. So I'm, I'm <laughs> like completely gone. Um, so what, I, what I'll tell you about today um, is um, um, I'll try to get you excited about LSST, Ruben Observatory's uh, survey of legacy, legacy survey of space and time that's going to start in about two years um, that will deliver a significant, I think, increase in, in, in just information and data that we have about the solar system. And I'll try to show you how we're going to get to that data uh, because collecting, sorry, to get to that information, because collecting data is one thing, actually being able to, to link, to identify those objects as asteroid is, asteroid is another. Um, and that itself required some five or six years of work to, to get us to a point where we're now confident that, that Ruben will deliver um, a 10X in, in asteroids um, and solar system information in just two or three years. So before, oops, before I start, um, I just want to want to emphasize that this what I'm going to present is really a work of a large team. Um, this is part of our group at the Iraq at, at UW, um, who have all contributed in one way or another to um, to this uh, to to the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, two two thing two people I really want to point out to you uh, is. Joachim Wentz, a graduate student who's built uh, a very interesting linking algorithm, and uh, Steven Stutzer, another one of our grads, who's working on applying some of these codes on, on existing uh, DECAM data and has uh, another algorithm that will allow us to, to go even deeper in the solar system. Um, there would be fantastic people to talk to if you want to learn more about this. Um, because this is my first time here speaking um, with, with my Dirac hat on, let me tell a little bit about what Dirac is first. It's an interdisciplinary center at UW. Um, it, it aims to support and advance research with complex or large astronomical data sets. Um, basically, our idea is to, to bring together and support people who are building data sets, surveys, algorithms, and tools, and then support them in using those tools in, in exploring and understanding the universe. So the kinds of things that we've done are science platforms for LSST, um, the real-time streaming technologies for ZTF that are now being adopted in LSST, the discoveries that you see of things like um, um, TDEs from, 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 um, uh, from ZTF have, have gone through, through these mechanisms. And the part that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, involves the solar system. Um, the legacy server of space and time will start in um, just a little bit over, no, just a little, a little bit under two years if everything is uh, goes on according to plan. And will be probably the, the defining survey of this decade when it comes to, to solar system exploration. Um, so it's a uh, eight meter telescope currently being finished in, uh, in the Chilean Andes at the Rubin Observatory. It will repeatedly image the visible sky every roughly three days to 24th magnitude, operate over 10 years. Over those 10 years, it'll collect something like 60 petabytes of raw data. Um, that amounts to about 40 billion stars, galaxies, and asteroids. Asteroids are only about um, five or six million. Um, and about 3 trillion observations. So that's about uh, 800 to 900 observations for each, each of these uh, objects. Then um, the nice thing about this survey is what you're gonna get out is a catalog uh, that's going to be well calibrated with high precision astrometry, uh, photometry, and also timekeeping, which is important for orbits. The way to think about LSST 
is that this is going to be a largely automated machine. So you have a, an eight meter telescope that conducts a survey. And unless there's a very interesting gravitational wave, it does its thing. There are no, there's no PI time, it's, it's all automated. Um, how to think about it, 500 pointings per night, roughly two visits to each pointing. And each pointing is 10 square degrees uh, down to R of 24. There are six bands, so UGR is UI. Um, that gives you about 5,000 unique square degree survey per night, twice. And then this gets repeated for 10 years, roughly 330 uh, nights per year is, is the nominal duty cycle. Um, in terms of schedule, this is where we are. This is the current forecast. This forecast now will get updated quarterly. So you can, you can see how, how well we're doing. Uh, but the, the three elements that I wanna point out are commissioning camera goes on the telescope in June, 2023. So in a year from now, we'll have first light. Um, then the commissioning camera is just 5% the size of, of the big 3.2 uh, gigapixel camera. The, the LSST cam, so the big camera goes uh, on the telescope a couple of months later in October 23. And then we immediately start commissioning. Um, if everything works according to plan, uh, we'll have commissioned it in um, something like six or seven months. So in March 24, uh, we, we have uh, a starting and in, in terms of the budget, there's, a, there's four months of scheduled contingency there um, as, as well. So the way to think about this is it'll start Right now, we're expecting LSSD to start sometime in mid 2024. So think about it as, let's say June, if I had to, if I had to pinpoint a number. But if everything works out really well, uh, it may start as early as March. Um, four main science teams to the survey: uh, probing dark matter and dark energy, mapping the Milky Way, exploring the transient optical sky, and the one that I'm really going to talk about today is uh, the census of the solar system. So the, the, the idea, I don't know how much you, you, you've heard of, uh, about the LSST before, but the, the big idea of this telescope was that once you reach a certain scale and you're able to automatically survey the sky and process the data, you can start covering multiple different areas of science, you know, everything from dark matter and dark energy to the solar system with one machine, with one telescope and with one data analysis system. And this is kind of what we're, what we're still attempting to do. So, now, let me focus a little bit on the solar system and what do we expect to find there. So this is a, a, a really beautiful movie of uh, asteroids discovered or whose color, I, I should say, was measured by this Long Digital Sky Survey um, made by Alex Parker, now it's Weary. And here is roughly, here are the counts of what we expect after LSSD is on the sky, how things are changed relative to where we are today. So, the, the, the survey should increase the number of known objects. I mean, that is going to be the, the major um, contribution of LSST, two major contributions. One, increasing the numbers of known objects basically across every population in the solar system by factors between the five to 30, depending on the population. And then two, every time we see these objects, we actually get to measure uh, precisely their magnitudes and in multiple bands. So therefore we are able to uh, estimate the colors and therefore some uh, use them as proxy of chemical composition. So you both get a population that suddenly, or a sample that is suddenly going to be a factor of 10 on average larger than, than the current sample. And that sample is going to be well characterized. So we'll have light curves, which tells you something about rotational periods and shapes and colors. Um, so a couple of things that I'll, I'll point out, Jupiter Trojans, right now we know about 10,000, uh, depending on what's really out there. If you, were, if you believe the models and size distributions, we should get that number up to 280,000. So that's going to be fantastic increase. And then TNOs, TNOs are one of the most interesting populations that should go up by a factor of 10 as well. So what can you do with this? Uh, science opportunities are numerous. I'm just going to give you a list here and point you to this paper by Meg Schwamm. Schwamm et al. and the, the science collaboration are listing all the different kinds of things you could do. Um, colors and composition, so just characterization studies. 
um, using that to understand what the composition of the, of the main belt is, how much water there is in the main belt, um, looking for uh, objects that, uh, that are potentially um, active. Uh, again, goes back to, uh, to, to this point, uh, rotation light curves, the size of the shapes, et cetera, et cetera. There's, a, there's quite a list. Um, same thing is going to be possible in the outer solar system. Outer solar system is particularly interesting because it essentially imprints the history of the solar system, uh, of, or I guess migration movement of planets in the solar system, both planets presently there and planets that potentially were, were there before. Um, and the, the, in this um, um, case, uh, we we're looking at, at an increase in about a factor of 10, uh, which will, in, in numbers of objects, which would, which would allow us to, to basically start distinguishing between different theories of, of, of planet migration. For example, are we looking at smooth migration? Are we looking at jumping migration? How many, were there additional planets uh, present early on in the solar system, et cetera? So you start getting, getting enough of a sampling and with colors of objects so that you can look at how populated certain resonances are or not. Um, so that's out of another list of, of things that you could do with the solar system, um, with the outer solar system. If we go one step beyond the outer solar system into really, really outer solar system, uh, there's this question about planet X. Um, and for, for a while, uh, the, this, uh, the team, there was an alignment of, of periapses uh, in, in the discovered population. Um, of, of Kuiper Belt objects, which would argue that there might be a, a planet that's aligning all of these um, with more of discoveries in, in surveys that have better characterized selection functions, specifically DES. This signal seems to be going away. So our internal joke is that it might be not planet nine, but planet nine. Um, but there are some good you know, reasons beyond just, uh, just, just this uh, argument with the periapses to check whether there's something in the outer solar system. There are uh, both theoretical reasons from the, from the formation of the solar system, as well as some other signals um, um, in, in, for example, the, the mid-plane of the Kuiper belt seems to be wobbly and you could explain that with, uh, with Earth-sized planets um, out uh, in the outer solar system. Um, if you have a big telescope, you're going to go and check. So this is one of the things that um, with, yes. Uh, down to 24, 24 and a half over the entire ecliptic. So it basically looking at DES. So this is a paper from this year by Belikov, Bernard Nelly and Brown. They looked at which part of the, of the, uh, parameter space is excluded by DES and ZTF, it's about 60%. And with they looked with LSST, what you would exclude and essentially is the rest. So, so yeah, for, for the, the uh, Brown and Batigan uh, version of the planet, I think we'll be able to say if it's, if it's there or not. And the last thing in this little tour are interstellar objects. Uh, we know of two, uh, depending on what's out there, we'll be seeing either one per year or up to 10 per year, depending on uh, how optimistic the, the group making the predictions um, is. Even at one per year, this is going to be extremely interesting. Um, oh, no, this is not a final thing. This is usually the final thing, more ways than one. Um, so uh, impacts on planetary defense. This is the, the most uh, recent scary video. This one is from uh, Chelyabinsk, Russia in 2013 of a small uh, 30 meter object exploding in the atmosphere. Um, right now we know about 35% of potentially hazardous asteroids larger than 140 meters. Uh, with LSST, that number should go up to something like 70%. And then with better software detection techniques, we could get it up to something like 85%. Um, so that's the, the kind of quick tour and list what's going to be doable. And the thing I really want you to, to remember or the key point of this is when all of this happens. And here is uh, a histogram of year of LSST, the year of LSST operations. So first year, second year, third year and so on versus main belt discoveries of asteroids. And these MBA discoveries are basically a proxy for all populations, main belt and further out. And everything essentially happens in the first three years. 
And more than half of these discoveries happen in the first year. Because what's going on is we just need, we need one. You've captured most of the population already. So that means in 2024 to 25 is, is when this is available for science. So now's, uh, now's, we're very excited about that and, and or now's the time to prepare for it really. It's not like dark energy where you, you'll, you'll be waiting a little bit to accumulate the data. Um, to illustrate that in another way, here's a simulation of the first month of LSST. And the fun thing that also shows you the realism of the simulation is these are discoveries. So the, the first uh, roughly 10 days had terrible weather in the simulation. That's why you see nothing here, um, which is great. I mean, it means simulation is, simulation is realistic. But then what you get is you get jump, you get to jump up to something like 25,000 discoveries per night. There's one night here with 70,000 discoveries. Um, and to give you a sense, there's a total of a million objects in the catalog right now, 1.1 million. So within about three months, we double the number of known objects. All right, so I hope I got you excited about the potential there, especially you know with, with your theorist hats on. Like this is the sample we're going to have to play, we're going to be able to play with, what can we, what can we learn from it? Now, I did do one slide of hand, and that is, I used a weasel word phrase up here, said the LSST data can increase the number of objects, but it means that they have the potential but all of this happens only if we're able to detect uh, these, these star-like objects, asteroidal objects in the images and identify them as asteroids in computer orbits. So this is what uh, I'm going to be talking about next, how this is actually done and whether it's, uh, it's going to work because it, um, it, it involves um, some quite sophisticated tooling and software that originally you wouldn't uh, think you would be necessary. So let's talk a little bit about how we find asteroids, how we distinguish, like how do you, you take an image and you, you take a look at it, how do you know that it's an asteroid? So a simple way of doing it is um, if you get very close, then it becomes easy. Um, it's also expensive. However, if you're not very close, this is what an asteroid looks like. Well, one of these is an asteroid. And I don't know if anyone can tell me which one. The answer is you can't, because this is this is a short exposure image, and the asteroid looks just what the name suggests. It looks star-like, asteroidal. So this is, in this case, this is an asteroid. Based on a single image, a single short exposure image, you, you essentially can tell. In a longer exposure image, the asteroid moves, so you can maybe see that it trails a little bit, but LSST images are going to be 30 seconds each. So what we do instead is, or what, what the community does instead, Oh, and it's really hard to see here. Sorry about that. Um, you take two images back to back, and then you're going to have to trust me that there's an object here and then an object here on the, on the next image. You essentially see a speck of light that moves between the two images. Hopefully, it's close enough together, and you can just say, oh, this is the same object. Uh, therefore, now I know that this speck here is you know, not a flare of some star or supernova, but it's an actual moving object and it's moving this direction. So that's sufficient to say this object is likely to be an asteroid. And then you need to compute its orbit. To compute its orbit, you need more pairs of observations like this, not on the same night, ideally in the next night or a couple of nights later. So you get a pair in a night, you get a pair next night or a couple of nights later, a pair a few more nights later, and then you have enough data to both connect these pairs, because this gives you a little vector to go from here to here and say, these, this is the same pair as this one. Um, and then to do the same thing from here to onwards, you get enough data to do that linking and you have enough data to compute the orbit. And this is how asteroids are discovered. So to discover an asteroid, it's not sufficient to do one observation. You actually have to have, have, to have multiple and you know, typically in a specific cadence. You, you, want, uh, you want pairs of observations per night so that you can tell which one, which of those um, uh, specks of light go together. The problem with that for larger surveys oops, 
sorry, technical issues. Oh, there we go. The problem with that with larger surveys is the deeper you go, the more of these objects you see. And so this is what a full focal plane of LSST looks like. Um, all of those are, are, are either real objects or um, artifacts that we expect to see because um, image processing is not perfect. So you get deep imaging, you get high densities, and then you get confusion because you see these specks of light coming in and out of existence. And there's so many of them per square degree that you can't confident, confidently say which one, is, which one links to which. Um, so the number of possible tracklets, each of these pairs is called the tracklet, grows. And the linking complexity goes is something like n cubed. So the more of these objects you have, the, the, the more horrible this problem becomes. Um, and if you're off, say, by a factor of two, um, with, with these types of algorithms, it means you effectively need 10 times more computing, uh, which is um, not the conversation you want to have with your program officer. Um, so the workaround these days is instead of taking pairs, take triplets or quads. So take three images in sequence. That way, if you see three objects that are in sequence or four objects, four detections that are in sequence, that's very unlikely to happen just by chance. Um, and that works. This is how virtually all asteroid survey programs work today. Um, the, the problem is the trade you've made. What you've just done is you've reduced your, the, the, your survey footprint, what you can survey each night by a factor of two, by going from pairs to, to quads. Um, and that becomes unacceptable for large multi-purpose sky surveys like, uh, like LSST, because we, you know, we also would love to, to find supernovae and, uh, and other things in the sky. So the, the first thing to, to find asteroids in LSST is to ask, can we, do, can we do better? Can we somehow retain the ability to link asteroids with just pairs uh, without, um, um, uh, can, can we retain the ability to, of, of, uh, to, to link asteroids with just pairs? And the, to, to give you, to give away the ending, the answer here is yes. And the crucial um, breakthrough came in 2018, actually from a Matt Holman, who noticed one thing. This is what, what an asteroid's um, trajectory looks like in the sky, um, observed from the Earth. So these, this is RA and DEC. And note that the, the range here in declination is much slow, much smaller in this diagram than, than in RA. So this is actually much straighter than you think it is. So for linking to work is you need to go from here, you need to be able to, say, to link from here to here, and then to here with, uh, with some you know, appreciable certainty. Um, and that means because these, these orbits uh, are curved, you will uh, want to, to, to leave a fairly large tolerance um, when, when trying to link this one to this one, to say this one here. That large tolerance that means you have more and more orbits that you need to test. Where does that curvature come from? What you're looking at, here is the Earth, here is the Sun, here is the asteroid. You're looking at this asteroid that's moving. The Earth itself is moving as well. So you're looking at this asteroid that, from a moving platform. And its, um, it's, it's trajectory in the sky is a combination of air motion and Earth's motion. And that's what drives the complexity of that trajectory. Now, there's a better vantage point in the solar system. What happens if you observe that asteroid from the sun? If you observe it from the sun, right? Sun is basically in the center of its potential modulo, the very center de detail. And from the point of view of the sun, this asteroid is moving on a great circle on the sky. So if you were standing in the sun with you know, appropriate SPF factor, um, you, would, you would see this object essentially move on a straight line. Um, in, uh, in over, over a small period of time. You see something like this. So that's the idea. Um, let's try to link these object not by, objects not by reconstructing their, their motion on the sky as, as uh, we, the, the practice has been so far, but let's transform into, into the coordinate system uh, where the origin is the sun. Um, in that coordinate system, they are much more linear and therefore the linking is going to be much easier to do. And there's one little detail here, which is that to make the transformation, you need to know how far you are from the asteroid and you don't. 
but not knowing has never stopped us from doing things. What you can do instead is you can assume. You can assume a number of different distances for this asteroid and try which one works. The one that works is going to make the orbit straight. So this is in essence what, what Matt uh, proposed and implemented. That's kind of the algorithm in the nutshell. You, you assume a, a distance, you transform to, uh, to heliocentric coordinate frame, and then each tracklet tells you how fast the asteroid is moving. So you can simply propagate these little arrows to a common epoch for each observation. And that common epoch is going to have a cluster of observations at that point. And then you run a cluster finding algorithm and you find your, you find your asteroids. Does that work? The short answer is yes. So what the, the NPC, the Minor Planet Center group did was to take this code and then run it on what's called the isolated tracklet file. This is a file that's been accumulating literally over, I think, more than half a century at the Minor Planet Center since the inception. These are all observations of pairs or more that were not attributed to known objects. Um, and there was no algorithm that could, that could pull them out easily. So they ran it on the ITF. It was over uh, 40, 40 million observations or 4 million travels, and they dug out 200,000 new, new objects. Question? Uh, the really high object? Uh, it, uh, the, oh, the question is, does it work if you have a really highest interest the object? Um, it does as long as the, the, uh, the time span that you're looking uh, over is, is fairly short. The, the other thing you can do is, there are two parameters here. You assume the distance, but you can also assume the rate of velocity. And so you can then have a two-dimensional grid of both distances and rate of velocities, and that picks up essentially all of them. Um, so this is the algorithm that we've, we've chosen to use for LSST. And you know, Matt and Matt and Matt, they're both Matt. Um, um, key insight was that the asteroids move in great circles in heliocentric reference frame. So, so let's just transform our sky into the sky, into sun's sky. Um, and then, but the other thing you can do is, is when you actually think about what they're doing there is to, to be able to make that transformation, you assume a distance, you assume the rate of velocity. At that point, you've assumed that you know the state vector of the object because the four other coordinates come from the tracklet. So at that point, you can work in 3D. You don't have to reproject to, this, to, the, to the plane of the sky. So you can literally say, I'm going to assume those, those two things, what, what is the distance of the, to the object and, and what the rate of velocity is. I'm going to propagate a full 2D solution for all the tracklets and then see where are clusters in 3D space as opposed to 2D space. And that turns out to improve things by a lot. Um, it adds another dimension in which you're doing clustering. And that dramatically reduces the crowding because now um, you, you also have a third dimension in which these clusters exist. So you, you've, you know, you've, you've increased the volume by a significant factor. And the other uh, kind of implementation detail is that this avoids the need to, to pixelize the sky because the, the way they did it in the original paper is they, they reproject the smaller cells in the sky because uh, they're, they're, they're keeping this um, notion of, of you know, the sky um, observing from the sun. And that, uh, that causes just some implementation discomfort. So we implemented this. Um, this, is, this is kind of an example of what this looks like in 3D. Here's, a, here's an assumption assumed R and DRDT. So R dot that's, um, um, consist that's, uh, that's appropriate for, for an NEO for um, AMOR. Um, these are different assumptions for distances. You see, if you get the distance wrong, all these little vectors are going to be they're not going to cluster perfectly together. They're going to be spread out. If you get the distance right, they're going to be uh, clustered together into one arrow. You can't even see the others. The interesting effect is that sometimes you can get the distance wrong and you still can get the clustering. And the fun thing is it doesn't matter because what you, what you care about is just to get the candidate cluster and then you can run orbit full, full orbit solution. So even you know, good clustering for wrong reasons still ends up, uh, ends up working well. Um, performance. Um, short answer is this works. So we've ran it on simulations over full two-week linking window, 97% completeness for, um, for, for essentially all outer uh, main belt onwards populations. Uh, 
we're especially worried about interstellar objects. That was the question about high centricities. Um, it, it works. Um, 97, 96% of completion of those. We're still working on NEO performance. Um, right now with completely untuned parameters, we, we recover something like 70%. Our, our internal goal is to have 95% on all of these. And in all cases, largely because of this 3D uh, shift, the purity is very high. So when we, when we get these clusters together, even before doing the IOD, you don't have that many to, um, um, to, to, to reject with, with IOD. Um, scaling is much improved. It's something like N log N with number of track, uh, uh, where N is number of tracklets. Um, and the, the constant factor is fairly small. The implementation that Ari put together and, and a lot of these ideas here come from Ari and Siegfried uh, is, is in C++ and extremely fast. And the bottom line here is that we're now able to replace what we originally uh, thought was going to be a small cluster or like a rack of machines for, for finding objects in LSST. Um, in essence, with something that I think is going to run on a you know, Mac Studio by the time we're, we're on the sky. Um, so this is like a wonderful example of where a good idea and a clever algorithm can, can, can solve the problem in a, in a wonderful way. Oh, and uh, I, I, have, I always have an issue when somebody shows me things that work on simulations and claims that they'll work in real life. Um, because that doesn't tend to be the case. So we ran this both on Atlas data and on Deccan data. Deccan data taken to similar depths uh, to LSST with, with uh, similar cadence, and we're, we're finding asteroids. So these are three objects that were found on, on Deccan with the, with the algorithm, um, and it, uh, it does seem like it works. So it, uh, it solves the Helilink with the, these 3D extensions solves our problem. Um, it, uh, Matt and, you know, Matt Holm and Matt Payne get all the credit for, for really coming up with this uh, idea that I think now just solves track of based linking algorithms. Um, but the, the other thing is that this tool can now be used by surveys, not just by LSST, but by any surveys in existence. And so that's, to me, that's the next step to try to, 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 to talk to, to, to those groups and try to see if we can set up some experiments, maybe like take, take two weeks of time operating in this mode. Um, especially PanStars might be interesting here, um, and see if we can improve the, our current survey system even before LSSD is on, on the sky. But bottom line is, yes, we will deliver those asteroid yields. Next up, um, can we do even better? So right now, what, what HelioLink solves is, um, how do I link together pairs of observations, tracklets from night to night? But if you think about this, if you put your dynamicist head on and think about this, you actually don't need pairs in each night to compute an object's orbit. You just need sufficient number of observations. The only reason why we're taking pairs in each night is because that allows us to more easily say, this pair in the first night goes together with this pair in the second night because I have a vector that I can extrapolate here and make that association. So pairs are here really to make our life easier. But if I took five observations of that asteroid and I knew that it was that asteroid, um, I could immediately solve the orbit for it as well, right? So the challenge here is not fundamental. It's not a fundamental problem of physics or math. It's just you know, computational complexity and convenience. So can we drop the track with requirement? Um, that's what... Uh, uh, one of our students, uh, Joachim Moens, uh, started looking at some four years ago now. And the idea is the following. You think of it as, as extending HelioLink. Um, with HelioLink, you have to, for each tracklet, you get four numbers. You get the direction of motion in the, in the on-sky plane and location in the on-sky plane. And you have to assume two numbers. You have to assume distance in R dot. With a single observation, you get only two numbers. So what if you assumed distance in R dot, but also assumed Vx and Vy? So the, the, the in-plane velocity. Um, that is now clearly a much larger space of assumptions. And it seems like incredibly expensive to do. But what it turns out is that it's, it's feasible. It's not as expensive. And the reason why is you don't have to be exactly right. You have to be only 
approximately right. If you assume that uh, there exists an object at a certain distance and radius and moves with a certain velocity, and then transform your observations into the frame of reference of that object. Any object that's on an orbit that's close to that test orbit, as we call it, its motion over that short period of time is going to be linearized. So imagine if you're standing on that asteroid and you're looking at asteroids that are close to you, really in phase space, and they'll be just you know, drifting by you on trajectories that roughly look like lines. So what that means with one assumption, if you have a line finding algorithm, once you make that transformation, you can pick out a whole bundle of orbits around that, that orbit that you've assumed um, and find all the asteroids that are adjacent to it. And with this, you can, instead of having to finally grid all of phase space, you can actually grid it fairly coarsely and recover, recover objects. It's still clearly more computationally expensive, but we have the CPU power that we need. So this is how, how those, uh, those lines look like. They're actually not lines in 2D space, they're lines in 3D space because time is the other axis. As these asteroids move um, um, uh, on lines, not just in RA deck, but they're also at a specific position at specific times. So you're looking at detecting 3D lines, which also helps. Um, so we implemented that, we named it THOR. Um, stands for trackless heliocentric orbit recovery. We clearly came up with the name before the acronym, um, but it's not entirely um, um, crazy. Uh, Dr. Jane Foster here um, is an astrophysicist and uh, apparently in the next movie that's coming out on July 8th, um, she will wield the hammer herself and be the mighty Thor. So I hope Disney gives us some credit for this and uh, <laughs> support. Because, you know, we're both, you have an astrophysicist, the, the algorithm's called Thor, and we're all saving the world by, in our case, finding asteroids. <laughs> all right, so we tried this out, whether, whether this is going to work. And we, the first place we tried it was Wiki Transiting Facility. Um, you can think of this as 0 0.1 LSSP. It's a wonderful precursor survey managed by Caltech. Uh, did a lot of work in the transient uh, um, space. And uh, this is, these are the results of application on Thor uh, on this data set. And the first thing you wanna do is, can you find, what you wanna check is, can you find known objects? One of the things with ETF is that it's fairly shallow. So almost everything that's, that's in it is already known and discovered. And we recover something like 96% of, of known objects. And we also recover one comet. Um, so on a fairly eccentric orbit. And the interesting thing was, if had we had this algorithm running at the time, we would have discovered this comet three months before its actual discovery. Um, so yeah, we, we really need to, to, to run this code just regularly. Um, the other thing is we could compare how well this does against um, our classical MOPS algorithm, the one that we're gonna use on, on LSST um, and uh, Z mode, which is an algorithm that's specific to, um, to ZTF. And it, it does significantly better. And the reason for why MOPS doesn't find as many asteroids, MOPS is this linking tracklets algorithm, basically HelioLink. You can think of it as that way, less, a less advanced version of HelioLink. The reason why uh, MOPS doesn't, doesn't discover these objects is because ZTF doesn't observe pairs all the time. Only a fraction of the survey, only a fraction of the time it observes pairs. But we're insensitive to that because now give us five points over a two week period and we'll find that object. So, so this worked out really nice, um, but ZTF is shallow. A more interesting catalog to look at, because now you know, we have an object that can find asteroids in data sets. We have a, an algorithm that can find asteroids in data sets that were completely, were thought to be unusable for solar system discovery. So now we can go and apply it to archival data sets. And a really good archival data sets to go, to go to look at is the NAR labs, um, Astro Dea Archives um, source, uh, NARLAB source catalog. So this is, these are basically sources detected on all the images that NARLAB has in their possession. And that's the number of telescopes, but the biggest and most important one is DECAM. So this is seven years of data from DECAM, including all of dark energy survey and all of the PI programs and so on. Um, 68 billion individual source measurements, once we reject those sources that are clearly static, that leaves us with about 1.7 billion 
uh, that might be asteroids or just flukes that, that might be moving. And the reason why that number is interesting is A, because it's big and there are real objects in it. And B, this is LSST scale. So if we can run on this scale, we, can, we're, we, we know we're kind of getting ready for LSST. So this is roughly what we found. We've so far ran on only 0.2% of data. That's 15% of September 2013 data set. This is really to validate the code before we start running um, um, at, at larger scale. And also to validate the process by which we submit this to the Minor Planet Center, because initially we, we got our submissions rejected because they were technically impossible, because they have, they have filters to require two observations each night. Um, so we've debugged all of that. In this first chunk of data, we've, we've linked 104 new objects. Um, these also pull the number of tracklets from the ITF, which means these are tracklets that are lost and now we understand whose objects they are. Here's a nice visualization of where those objects are, kind of what their orbits are. And this is a moment at which we, we ran discovery. So that's why they're all kind of lined up in the same, in the same direction because in those, that bunch of observing, that's where that cam was, was looking. Um, and a number of them have no tracklets at all. So no, no pairs of observations in, in single night. So you couldn't tell that uh, it would be impossible to, to identify them with anything that uh, uh, any of the prior codes. So this, is, this was really fun to see that it, it works. Um, it, it got picked up by the media who, you know, we, we sort of kept emphasizing that this doesn't work on NEOs yet. And we're working on that piece of the code, but, and the article that never does say that it does, but apparently the editor is the one who chooses the title. And yeah, the, the, the reason why I show this is I kept thinking about ways to describe the code and what, what it does. And Kenneth kind of Chang from New York Times, who, who wrote this, I think he came like with the best explanation I've ever seen. In essence, the researchers developed a way to discover what has yet already been seen, but not noticed. So all these objects were in the database, they were cataloged, but it wasn't noticed that they were asteroids, uh, which I find quite nice and poetic. Um, this is all available. So the code is on, uh, on GitHub. You can download it, you can run it. it uh, it's mostly Python and Numba. Uh, working, we're working further performance optimizations. And this does require a lot of CPU power. Um, and so we have implemented this. We actually run this on, on Google's cloud. This initial 0.2% took something like a day or two. So it wasn't that, that much. But going forward, for the full data set, we'll need, uh, we'll need lots more compute power. And the reason why I went to the cloud was, A, there's a lot of CPU power, but you can do that in your local cluster as well. But the nice thing that we get is scalability and the ease of building services. And scalability means if I'm impatient and I want this to run by tomorrow, I can get 10,000 cores right now. Don't have to sit in a queue. Um, and the ease of building services means we can now build a website very easily and open it up to the world where anyone can simply upload you know, their night of observing and we'll run the algorithm. You don't even have to in install it yourself. So when I'm thinking about how we can work with the survey community, all, all we have to do is to you know, convince them that we've done our cybersecurity right and nobody's going to steal the data that they're uploading to us. Um, and in essence, they can just start uploading and if our code works, they'll discover more asteroids than they could otherwise. So, so that was, um, that was the reason for it, and it, it, it so far it's just working out quite uh, quite nicely. And yeah, so are you starting with images? No, in, in doing the photometry, or you're taking a catalog? So the question was if we're starting with images, and the answer is we, we're not. We're we're starting with the catalog. Um, this is, and this is the beautiful thing about the NARLAB source catalog, because NARLAB did all that for us, all the hard work of getting getting data out of the images. Um, so we can all do, do this all at the catalog level, and then that's why it becomes even easier for other surveys to adopt it because it's easy oh, to upload the catalog. For yeah. So with, with LSST, right, we can take the public alert stream and basically just go ahead and do it. And <clears throat> the nice thing, uh, one secondary thing that I didn't appreciate was that um, because this was on Google, then they, they noticed the, the articles, and then Google CEO um, also tweeted saying, hey, this is great. It runs in Google. 
And the reason why one cares about this is that this requires software engineers and you wanna hire software engineers and that's a really competitive market right now. So if you can show them this, you know, suddenly you're cool. <laughs> so you know, don't underestimate the power of a tweet. Um, so um, bottom line on Thor, um, the, the, the two X arguments, so what, what that means is I kind of tell my students to look for things that are going to work at least 10 times better. Uh, and if, if they cannot find something 10 times better then aim for at least two times better to, to be worth their time. So why is this, why is Thor worth their time? Um, it does a lot of searching for archival data, but I think more importantly, it allows for better yields and cadence to reoptimizations of future surveys. So including LSST. So for example, if we can switch to something like Thor with LSST, then we don't have to observe 5,000 square degrees per night, we can observe 10,000 square degrees. So that opens up the space for, for finding more transients. So it helps with non-solar system science. Um, it, with this algorithm, we have the number of remaining unknown PHAs. So we have the re residual risks. We've looked at how many objects we would find. And then um, there are NASA missions that are, that are being planned and used surveyor to reach, uh, to, to find um, up to 90% of potentially hazardous asteroids. Right now, it's not clear that they'll actually meet that goal with, with the, the current proposed strategy, but we'd love to, to look into that and, and, and work out if, if um, basically exactly the same mission, but slightly different deployment and different algorithm can get you there faster. So bottom line is that if we take into account, you know, how much time it took to, to develop this and how much say a compute power would it take to, to run this on something like LSST, you're looking at something on order of 5 million investment into people and compute that then yields in, in certain metrics at two times improvement on, on a mission that's uh, essentially a billion dollars. So 5 million on a billion dollar mission is equivalent to, I think 15 days. And, I, and this, this gives us more than 15 days worth of improvement. All right, so the third and, and last part of, of my talk is, um, can we go deeper? So I talked about, can we find asteroids? Yes. Can we find them better? Yes. Can we find um, asteroids more, more further out in the solar system, um, deeper than, than an individual LSST exposure is right now? Um, this is something that we do for galaxies, right? So let me, let me step back first and say, um, all of this linking that I talked about works in catalog space as yes. And for catalogs to exist, it means that we need to identify an object in each individual image. So that means we're limited by the depth of each single 30 second exposure. For galaxies and variable stars, sorry, for galaxies and stars onwards, things that don't move, you can go deeper by stacking, by the images. Um, and, and that's really the, the plan for all of LSST's dark energy work, um, go deeper by co-addition. For solar system objects, because they move, we can't, because in each image they're in different position. Except that maybe we can. Is there a question? Do you want to and ask a question? Sorry, I, I did have my hand raised. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt anything. I, it was on the Thor stuff, so maybe it can wait till later. I don't want to interrupt. This bit of it. I'm, I'm fine with now as, as well as later. It's okay, okay. Great. So I mean, yeah, the question was about whether there's a prior on the uh, photometric brightness of these linked objects that you're doing, and if not, or if yes if there is any uh, possible uh, degeneracy that could be re resulting from you know, a bunch of uh, faint transients on the sky uh, leading to some link in the uh, projected um, track space. Yeah, the, the short answer is no. Uh, we intentionally don't impose a prior um, because um, you're right that you would, most of the time these objects don't change, don't change brightness that much, but some of the time they do when they have outbursts and those are the most interesting objects that you want to find and our prior would bias against them at that point so we're, we're trying hard to only use astrometry 
Okay, but th that being said, do, is there an estimate of how many sort of fake associations you'll find from, from, oh, from, from, other, trans, uh, from transients just popping up that you're then finding sort of um, spurious tracks to link them? Yeah, so as, as long as we're talking about arcs, so uh, where these discoveries are of, of longer than say two to three days, in essence, the estimate is zero because it's, it's very hard for, for five flukes or five you know, spurious objects to be aligned um, on, on something that looks like a Keplerian orbit over a, a two week period, which is typically what we, we're seeing. So we, we've actually tested this and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's negligible, it's essentially it's zero. Thank you. All right, so, so let's talk about how we go deeper. Um, I said we cannot naively stack images because objects move on them. But here are three images taken three different times. You should like these are these are the same pairs of stars, uh, and this is our object that moves. You can clearly see that it moves. Um, this object is identifiable in each image in this case, just to to make it easier for you to see it. But if I knew that there was an object here, what I could do is I could shift these images so that I align these pixels. So these pixels always fall in the same place. So that I align these pixels so that I, I add what's in this circle together. And if I do that, this is my coad. So this coad correctly adds this object and it actually suppresses the background at the same time or background stars. Um, <clears throat> this is what's called shifting and stacking. It's also known as digital tracking. It's also known as synthetic, synthetic tracking. And I think there are three more names that it has depending on the community. Um, the problem of course, for searching objects is that you don't know what the orbit of an asteroid is. So we do the same thing that we do with Thor. And this is not something that we invented when people have been doing this for, for decades now in, in various, uh, various ways. But if you think about it, it's essentially the same, the same idea and the same problem. So the, the difficulty here is that you, you want to run over all plausible motion vectors, over all plausible orbits. And here, the number of plausible orbits is huge. We're talking trillions of orbits. And you have to do, you have to shift each image. So you assume an orbit, you shift all the images in the stack, you co-add them, and you look whether something has popped up. That's basically the idea of the algorithm. And then you have to do that billions of times. So this is like building a co-add but not one coad, but building a billion coads and then detecting on them and trying to find objects. So computationally incredibly uh, expensive, but also incredibly parallel and vectorizable. So what the, what the idea here was, let's implement this on a GPU because the GPU can do this very quickly. It's essentially a machine that's built for this. Um, the, the, the code is called KBMOD. It's, uh, it's in this GitHub repository. And the, the short answer is that um, this also worked. For by now, we've uh, applied it to two different surveys. In the first one, we found about a dozen new KBOs. In the second one, we found about 75. Uh, there's a whole interesting talk worth of material on, on using convolutional neural networks to, to uh, reduce the number of false positives in this, in this data set. But this is the kind of thing that we get. The code will pull out um, objects that on each individual exposure, and in some exposures you can't see it at all because it's signal to noise is like one, three, 0 0.18. In some exposures, it's, you can tell that there's something there because the, the seeing was very good that night. And then when you call it together, you get a really, really nice and safe detection. And you apply that, um, the, the, the results you get from this small sample uh, seem reasonable. Um, these are fairly small numbers, only 75. The, the, but the, the, the reason why this code was built was for, for really for this survey. This is the, the deep survey, the Deccan Ecliptic Exploration Project, 46 nights on the Blanco. Um, Dave Trilling is, is the, the PI at NAU and um, with the colleagues in Michigan, we're doing the, the data analysis. There are these four triangular fields that are six hours apart in the sky. Here's an example of one of those fields. So in one year we observed these three fields then the next year we observed these nine fields. And then the next year we observed everything to, to kind of catch all KBOs that might be moving in all these directions. Um, and 
right now we've processed the, uh, the, the we've done the analysis for only one field, but the uh, with KD mod and here is an example of a result of a result that we're getting. We're finding objects and we're finding large numbers of objects. How deep we can go um, goes to you know something like 26 magnitude um, in terms of depth. Um, in terms of efficiency, this is based on inserting fakes. We're we're losing about 20% of objects right now, but um, there there are ways to to get that back. You can ask me later. Um, and this is kind of the first result. These are the, the objects that we've recovered so far. We have 2,200 2, single light observations of moving objects. So these are not actually objects. Some of them are going to be observations of the same object. But you know, roughly, we're looking at something like 1,000 objects that, that we're seeing in this data set. And given there are 4,000 known, we have four fields. We're expecting to find something like uh, at least 3,000 new, new KBOs by the time we're done uh, next year. So this is really like that factor of two for, for this code, why, why it, uh, it, it really you know, it couldn't be done without something like, uh, like efficient shifting and stacking. And here's what happens when you start shifting and stacking across years. Because if we detect in each epoch and link between each epoch, we can then do a stack over multiple years. So that, that hasn't been uh, typically done so far. Um, all right, I'm running through this a little bit because I see the time, um, but I'm, I'm think two slides from, from the end. So where is this part going? So right now we have about 4,000 no KBOs. And with these kinds of this, these kinds of algorithms, we're going to get to about 7,000 by the end of 2023 from just from deep survey. We'll, we'll find about 3,000 of them. Um, LSST goes in the sky in 2025 and delivers us another you know, 30 or 33,000 up to, to 40,000. All these numbers are in you know, plus or minus 50% because we're doing massive extrapolations um, in terms of what, which power laws are assumed for the size distribution. So that's two years later, you go to 40,000. And then this is the part that gets me excited, which is this here is all single epoch data in LSST. If we can do shift and stack with LSST, this number with only 10 stacking, only 10 exposures in LSST goes up to something like 150,000. Again, massively dependent on what the, what the actual size distribution is, but that's the thing that we want to learn. So if we, I think we're, we're all going to be happy with 40,000, do a lot of science here, but then when we, when we start becoming unhappy with the 40,000 and think about what the next step is in 26 or, or so, uh, I think we'll have these algorithms at a level where, where we can start shifting and stacking um, um, months worth of LSSD data and really going deep into the Kuiper belt. So um, that's what I wanted to, to show you. Um, the, the short summary is in the next five years, and I think really starting in three years, uh, we'll increase by factors between five and 30, the number of known objects in nearly every small body population in the solar system. So if you're working on solar system dynamics, this really is a sample to get excited about. And also we'll be reporting this to the minor planet center essentially in real time, which means that this sample is public. So that, that's a kind of key issue uh, with, with you know, these, these kinds of big things that have proprietary periods and some, and some pieces of, of, of data. But for solar system, essentially you can get everything um, almost immediately. And then the reason why we can do that is because a there was a big telescope that was that was built that we shouldn't underestimate that, but but b because um, you know, that group that I've shown you plus a, a larger halo of people working on image processing have worked on this for for the last uh, ten years to to make this work, including developing really dramatically different new algorithms that allow us to to do this. And just on a personal note, after ten years of working on analysis, t it's really satisfying to start seeing that code applied to real data right now. And we're writing papers, um, like deep, I think deep papers should be submitted in about a month. We have a sequence of seven papers that we're trying to push out at the same time. Um, and, and like that gives us confidence that this will this will work for, for LSST as well. And then in, in two years, we go to the next level and look at what LSST tells us about the solar system. So thank you um, very much. Any questions?
for this fascinating talk. Are there any questions? Oh, my question is, how do you know if you're close to the limit of finding all the asteroids? Like if you expect 10 times more, but maybe there aren't 10 times more asteroids, like how do you know if there are 10 times more asteroids? Um, so maybe the question is, how do I know that that my code hasn't seen them? That, that my code is functioning well, that there's just nothing there. Uh, the, the way we do it right now is I inject fake functions. So take the actual image, uh, we, we know what the PSF looks like on the image, and we can inject fake objects into images with fairly high fidelity. Um, and we do it in a double blind way. We don't actually know which one is fake and which one isn't until the end. And that, that's how the, the, those completeness curves that I showed you that said 78%, that's how they were constructed. So that's that's how we do it here. And then you can do a small, smaller pointed surveys with a more traditional techniques if you wanted to, to really double check. So of course there's a difference between detecting objects and finding orbits for them. And particularly with the, you know, this dramatic increase you have in the number of, of trans-Neptunian objects, is that detections or orbits? And if it's not orbits, how are you going to find the orbits? It's uh, it's it's orbits. Um, I think that the, the thing that you're pointing at is these objects. The the key questions we want to know is are they in resonance or not. So the, the orbits will have to be detected will have to be measured with some level of research. It's definitely the case that in year one, kinds of questions you, you're going to be they're going to be easily answerable are size distributions. Um, um you know rotational periods things that are more physical properties as data accumulates year two year three you get a better and better handle on the orbit and um i think at, at that point we have much more dynamical information but yeah every time we just to make it clear every all these numbers assume orbits because uh, we, we don't report unless we have an orbit that you thought it was harder to find neos but you didn't really say why it's not completely obvious to me um, they move faster. That's uh, move quickly on the sky. That's that's basically the, the the very short answer. So that means that the number of objects or number of points that you have to consider together as potential pairs or as potentially going together is much much larger. They don't they don't move fast enough that you can see them streak, for example. So that is the that's the saving grace of it. That's what sets up the the the, the upper limit uh, as as high far you can go. And that's why I believe this is possible. Right? If we could, if if this is these are really short exposures and I couldn't tell that they're streaking, then there would be no upper limit and I couldn't really get the, the fastest ones. Uh, so I had uh, kind of two questions. Uh, the first kind of follows on what Scott was saying about orbits. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, uh, like what uh, what the uncertainty is on those orbits. And like we're starting to, we're getting to a place where we're seeing, you know, a good fraction of what's in the solar system. So how stable are those orbits? Are those changing over time? Um, so for, I think everything that's kind of in our solar system, um, because these objects really do change appreciably. The outer solar system is where things get more difficult. Um, and the orbit will just, quality will depend on, on the arc of observation. So in each, each year, we're going to have an order of, let's say 50 observations. You know, there's there's 80 observations nominally, but you know, some of these objects are not going to be detected in the U band and so on. So you're going to have a year with about uh, and then okay, uh, and a uh, somewhat related question. I didn't fully understand uh, the argument. Uh, where you were showing, you had the, the figure where you were showing the clustering in those uh, vectors. And when they were clustered together, that tells you, I think, the distance to the object. I, I didn't fully understand uh, why it doesn't matter if we look at the wrong cluster. Oh, I see. 
So this it's this one. Um, so what this is, this is this is basically an algorithm to tell you. So th this is just one set of arrows that be belongs to the same object. In in reality, there would be here many sets of arrows belonging to different objects. What you need to do is you need to notice that what you what you want to do is you want to notice that arrows coming from the same object have actually fallen into the same cluster. And that, that gives you a sense, or that, uh, that kind of tells you that these, are, these potentially do come from the same object. And therefore I'm going to go and solve the orbit solution for this object in you know, traditional ways. Um, whether you've taken those N observations because you've noticed that all of their errors fell on top of each other here, or because it so happened that they fell here, or because some you know, entity told you that these five go together, together it doesn't matter. So how, how you know that those five go together, um, it doesn't matter. It just matters that you actually find that cluster and then attempt to fit the orbit. Because if it turns out that it's a correct orbit, you'll get a, get a nice chi squared and, and immediately can accept it. Okay, so we're not getting the distance from this. No, 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 we're assuming the distance is here. The place where you are kind of using the distances and I'm going down the rabbit hole a bit is that's how you in initialize your um, differential correction in the orbit uh, calculation algorithm. So if you have the close to the right distance, the, the algorithm is going to uh, converge faster. But if, if you don't, then um, it'll just take a little bit more, more, more time. We're talking milliseconds here. So I had a quick question about uh, sort of Thor as a service part of, the, of this. Um, so, you know, LSST, uh, obviously, as you know, its own like sort of data science computing platform and access given the, um, and I think, so there are some possibilities of say, using this to allow for say other surveys to run things. But I was very curious if you could speak a bit more about whether other parts of the team are thinking about this more generally as like a way to really enable say both outreach or really data utilization from lots of amateur astronomers. I could imagine, for instance, you know, uh, for students in like university or high school or just people in general, like you combine this with astrometry.net to allow anyone to kind of upload some batch of images to search for things. Yeah. Is this something that, you know, LSST is kind of thinking more broadly, like not just with Thor, but with other aspects of the, of the code in the pipelines? So, so, so for, from the point of view of LSST, um, kind of with, with my LSST hat on, the only thing I'm thinking about is Heliolink because that's kind of our approved, you know, algorithm, FDA approved algorithm. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it makes perfect sense, right? You want something that's reliable and you know it will work. You just spent a billion dollars. You don't want to mess around with somebody's experimental code. But the what we're what we're going to do with with LSST is LSST will be publishing in real time all these data in in a, in a stream of alerts. So if we have this ready, we can basically take that stream of alerts and as with my LSST hat on, I'll be running HelioLink on that, but with my you know, interested researcher hat on, I can be running Thor at the same time. And then if we show that this works equally well over some period of time, at that point you go like, yeah, why should we continue running here? But you're completely right. This service knows nothing about the specifics of the telescope. It only knows to, it only needs to know, you know, what are the R index? What is the time? What are the, what are the errors, uh, um, astrometric errors? And what's the location of the observer? And so it's been built with that in mind that ideally, ideal system would be every single survey on earth sends data into, into this one bucket, and then we can link between different surveys. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and if you, if you want a citizen science project, I have a much better one for you with this. Uh, right now we're running on Google Cloud. I think we can run on this. So imagine waking up in the morning and your phone tells you you've discovered three asteroids. Because it's it's a lot of compute power, but there are a lot of these devices out there. And even if you took only a sliver of their CPU time while they're charging, and this is not a big data problem, so you can transfer the data. You can make a really powerful kind of crowdsourced platforms for, for doing this, this sort of thing. We can't hear you. Hello? 
quick question. Uh, what uh, will you get about the composition? Um, we will get broadband colors. So broadband colors give us a sense, um, you know, they're, they're good enough to determine taxonomy at a pushing between, you know, definitely CNS types and, and best ways or M's like maybe five or six classes. Uh, beyond that, it's, it's, it's very tough to, well, beyond that, I think it'll, it'll be, it'll be tougher to, to go into details of the composition, but I'm, Honestly, I'm, this is a little bit outside of my area, and I'm, I'm sure there's, there's someone who's coming up with a clever way to, to, to retrieve you know, some feature from broadband photometry as well. Sorry, I can't answer that in more detail. So I have, I have read my question, but I want to just follow up on that. So my understanding is uh, for 2024, LCC still will start with the pairwise uh, exposure that won't be changed yeah. okay yeah. and so my question is so this is all great and seeing all in the solar system but this reminds me about all the high prop motion star stuff so i'm wondering if maybe that's a much easier question but that's probably different scale but i'm wondering if any of the thing you have done here will be applied to that as well for lsst um it's it's similar uh so question was about uh, whether any of this would be applicable to finding high prop motion objects um I think high proper motion objects, let me think. Um, we, we may, I think the same code, they're in many ways easier than, than, than the problem we're having here because they're, they're moving um, slower. Um, so I think the same code could be applied to find high proper motion objects, but you can probably get away with something much, much simpler. Um, one thing we're looking at with high proper motion objects is uh, we're, we're, well, with proper motions in general is whether we can fit for proper motions um, directly on, on, on pixels. So rather than detect each individual image and then fit proper motion to it, take the stack of images of that object and then fit for you know, the, the optimal proper motion magnitude of the object and location of the object at t equals zero. And that should, that should be a better estimate of proper motion than, than individual detections. Sorry. Which is like the last one we talked about here, the stack one and the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of it's kind of similar to to this. Let me show you to this, except that except with proper motion, uh, which is much smaller. Um, so it's it's a very kind of simple version of of of, of this, but yeah, like that kind of thing. Okay. Mario again for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone online and thanks everyone here. Uh,